Well, in our we can ask any Okay, good. We are Modernized in our Okay, that's a lot of times people think I is now joining. Just join. Okay. Well, I think it's time to start. Oh, good. Well, we can start now. Okay. Good enough. Well, let's go ahead and call this uh, meeting to order. We want to be respectful of everyone's um, time, and uh, we have a, a action-packed agenda today. So we'll proceed uh, smartly. The first thing we do is a uh, board member roll call. So, uh, and we have some folks in, in person here today, so that's even better. Uh, Commissioner Bremer? Here. Commissioner Gonzalez? I'm here, thank you. Great, welcome. Council Member Avila? Not quite yet, okay. Council Member Sam Geek? Here. Kari Kilroy? Kari? You might be reaching for the mute button. Okay. Well, I'm sure she'll announce when she gets in. Doris, I see you here. Yes. Dr. Vu? I'm here. Uh, uh, Fire Chief Ted Colas, I believe you're on, on uh, Teams? I am, thank you. Welcome, and I'm here too. So we have a, we have a quorum. Okay, our first action item is approval of agenda. <laughs> And as I mentioned, we have a lot going on today. So um, uh, after you've had an opportunity to take a quick look at that and you have the materials in front of you, I would entertain a motion to approve. I moved. And a second? Second. Okay, agenda approved. Um, Board of Health comments. And uh, let me just kind of go around the room here. Do we have any Board of Health member uh, comments this morning. I've got one. Yes, yes, sir. I did notice that uh, or was noted last night that our council meeting that uh, next Tuesday and Wednesday. Yes. No, it's voice over off. Facility down south will be done. Okay. Wednesdays or Tuesdays the, the black pot down. And okay. Wednesday, hopefully the outstanding. So. Well, continued continued progress at that facility, and I believe perhaps during the director's report we'll hear about even more positive uses for that facility in, in Fountain as well. Very good. And um, Council Member Yolanda Vila is here. Welcome. Good morning. Good and, and you're next. You're next on the agenda. I am. How about that? So. Wow. Well, this is Commissioner uh, Gonzalez. I got one comment, a question. I'm sorry, Longinos, here, I, I didn't see a hand. I'm sorry, please, sir. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, I did see some, uh, I say internet chatter or whatever you want to call it, uh, social media chatter about the news article yesterday uh, on the, new, uh, the TV news indicating public health would be calling individuals, you know, asking that they get their shots. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. It was confusing if they meant state or local, and then the chatter was how do people how do, how does public health know who did or didn't get their shots? And so there was some concern of privacy, and I just want to clarify who's doing that call, et cetera, or what the state's I, the actual I plan is. I appreciate that request for clarification too. I saw the headline, but I didn't. Indeed. Yes. And Commissioner Gonzalez, um, that's initiated from the state health department. So that is led um, through the, the governor's office as well as the state health department. And we can get more clarification on that. And that's part of and, and I Go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to put that on the record that that was the state and not local and that it's a program that they are attempting. Uh, and if we get additional details, that would be good to put out so that there's less confusion. But I did want on the record want to put that out there in case anybody was listening in and had that question uh, or concern. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Vu. If I remember right, it was for second doses. Oh, okay. That's my memory. 
So state led and reference second doses. Okay. And, so and it's it's part of uh, of the ongoing and bigger initiative as it relates to prevention and different strategies as part of the um, COVID um, prevention campaign, immunization campaign. Okay. All right. Good. And during the director's report, we'll hear more about um, uh, how we're doing with vaccinations here in, in El Paso County. So, very good. Any other board members who have a, a comment during this part of the meeting? No? Okay. Well, um, Council Member Yolanda Vila, I, I appreciate you and you have the esteemed status of being a COVID veteran. Anybody who, <laughs> anybody who served on the, the, the Board of Health during the, the year of, of 2020, I believe, deserves special status. This is this has been you can mark that one down in your diary or, or whatever, but I really uh, personally want to extend my thanks and for doing a great job. Uh, whereas I know Susan, you have you have some some comments here, and then I'll kind of I'll kind of finish up. Go ahead. Sure. Sure. Hi. Hi. Um, good to see you, and I'm so happy that that you're here. Um, and and so this is a a follow up, I believe, um, as members of the Board of Health are term limited, um, and uh, this. This uh, we wanted to um, acknowledge and, and recognize you for all of the, the partnerships and your leadership on the Board of Health. And I guess my part would be um, I wanted to personally thank um, Yolanda for some of the work that we have done. And when I say we, it's it's the Board of Health as well as um, numerous different public health team members and, and some of the focuses that you've had. Um, and that we've partnered with you on. But some of the things that, that stand out for me is um, that you know, during COVID is is most recent, but um, you've initiated and helped um, put together remote meetings in um, Southeast Colorado, where we've got a tremendous turnout, and we've provided um, really open lines of communication as it relates to COVID, and, and you know, gaining information and, and um, increasing awareness in um, the uh, Southeast area, and increasing information on. Um, resources and access and knowing that there's a lot of um, misinformation out there. So to be able to um, offer that type of um, those types of connections, I think is highly um, important. And also Yolanda also serves on the vaccine consortium and she's been with uh, um, that consortium and us through the beginning and um, not even uh, just COVID, but um, during your time and your leadership on the Board of Health, focusing on health disparities. And that work has not stopped on the Vaccine Consortium and helping us um, related to, to outreach and, and innovative ideas and um, strategies. And um, she's made all of the meetings highly engaged and, and um, um, uh, very participatory as well. And Yolanda and I, meet on a routine basis and, and I would still like to meet on a routine basis and continue the work that that we've been um, doing together. And, and I know Yolanda and I, we, we talk frequently. And so we'll still keep in touch because as we all know, El Paso County is what, 748,000 people. Um, and it's all of the Board of Health, including Yolanda and, and any leader, and, you know, it's not just a title. Um, it's, you know, anyone who wants to take initiative and, and uh, connect and, and make some progress and I, I look forward to the continuing work together. So there's a, a, a long list of um, so many different aspects that you've demonstrated leadership in Yolanda and so I can't cover them all take initiative um, and but just wanted to, to say a few words and just know that I appreciate you um, and as well as the entire team at, at public health and, and we look forward to continuing to to work together. Thank you Susan. Well, let me pile on a little bit here too. I wanted to say thank you for your uh, eager and uh, frequent participation in our Board of Health meetings. And that's something that I really uh, look for and appreciate in a Board of Health member is folks who who speak up and uh, inject new ideas and, and have, have comments and, and uh, all very relevant. Um, I think that you particularly have been a passionate champion uh, for your district and 
you have mentioned again and again the uh, topic of health disparities. And I just wanted to reassure you that that we get it. Social determinants of health uh, and a focus on health disparities is uh, baked into uh, uh, every one of our public health programs here in El Paso County. And, and uh, it's always good to be reminded of that. Uh, and uh, we, we take notice of your comments. And as you transition from the health board back to your regular duties at the city council, I just again wanted to wanted to say thank you and and we appreciate you. We do have a little award for you also, but I thought maybe you'd want to go ahead and and do you have any comments? For I, us? I, I do. Um, so when I was at Colorado College, my professor of economics, Adela de la Torre, I ended up getting my degree in political econo economics because I followed and took every class she had. Mm -hmm. And so she had her PhD in, in public health as she was teaching at Colorado College. And she asked me to do an internship with her and go to um, to the Joaquin Valley in, in California to look at infant and maternal health for those migrant workers that were serving on the farms. And it was really heartbreaking because uh, I interview women, a very detailed uh, invasive interviews about their life. And there was this one woman who was like eight months pregnant and she had boils all over her body uh, from, the, from the pesticide. And there was a duffel bag that was really, you know, pretty tall and full. And her husband says, pick that up. And I went like this and I'm young and, you know, pretty strong and I couldn't pick it up. She got that bag and flipped it over her, uh, her back. And um, so getting to see that, I was like, wow. And then later I did my thesis on maternal and infant care in Mexico City and the health disparities there and what was going with the pot, it being at that time the third largest city in, in the world. And so I, I did my thesis on that. And so I did, I always thought I was like in the really hardcore political economics thing, but then I would do, I don't know, it wasn't deliberate. I was always drawn to it, but without really realizing it, you know? And so I, I did it on that and it was, it was great. I got an A on it. And um, then oh, as we were getting on boards, Richard Scorman kept coming to me. He's like, Yolanda, we talk about the Southeast and the disparities there. I would really like, I think this is your, your place to go. <laughs> and I was like, Shh, okay, <laughs> sure. You know, because we serve on a lot of boards and committees, right? And then um, when I got here, I said, this is home. It so resonated with me. I was like, this is where I belong. And so it has been such a pleasure working with each and every one of you. Uh, the whole board, I'm some of the board members have left, but I've gotten to know um, Dr. Vu and Ted Colas through work and, and through being on the consortium. And um, it, it, the work that you do is, is God's work. And so I, I appreciate this. Um, I'm not going to let it go. I'm always going to be engaged with, with the community, communities that are really impacted, not just in Southeast, but the whole county. And um, it just it just meant a lot. I learned so much being here. And Susan, your staff, it's, you as a leader is incredible. And I mean it, you know. Body and Stephen, the dynamic duel, and Dr. Johnson, and uh, all these people that came to do presentations in front of City Council and everywhere else. So, just top notch group here at Opesa County Board of Health. And thank you for the privilege of letting me be here. Thank you. Thank you, Yolanda, for your service. Any other board member comment? <laughs> to say I really appreciated your candor in all the meetings and it, it's okay to disagree and good about that and votes were taken we heard of that and I appreciated that that was a really positive piece of information I thought okay online all right I think we have a photo op 
right? Well, so if, if we could wait for the photos to later, because okay. we've, we've got, um, we have a, a crystal for you, like Yolanda, and um, Yolanda, what it says, and we'll take a photo in a bit, um, if that's okay. But it's, um, the public health logo in recognition of Yolanda Avila for your dedicated service as a member of El Paso County Board of Health 2019 to 2021. And those are probably the, the this past 15 months has been the toughest, I think, in the history of, of public health. So um, you're on the board at the, the right time and, and we will definitely continue to work together um, in the future. So just because you're not a Board of Health member doesn't mean that you're getting rid of us either. <laughs> so we will definitely- I think Ted Polis um, has a comment be, too. Be in touch. Yeah. Okay, good. Ted? Yeah, I just wanted to thank uh, Yolanda and uh, my history with Yolanda tells me that uh, while she may not sit on the board actively as a member any longer, she's no, uh, there'll be no lack of input uh, when she sees something of concern and I'm very grateful for that. She's very much involved with her community and all of Colorado Springs and El Paso County. So thank you. Yeah, good. Good, good. Any other board member comments? We have some other awards and I think we'll do the photos together. Right. Yes, we'll, That's the plan. Yes. OK, be more that sure. makes that makes sense as well. So we'll take a photo. Uh, this is Lohino. Yes. Oh, you know. Thank you. I just wanted to I just wanted to thank Yolanda for all the great work that she's done. I've gotten to know her uh, from before uh, either of us had gotten elected to our current positions uh, and, and know all the active work that she's done for our community there in the southeast. Uh, so I've seen it for several years uh, before our elections and and know how much she does care about the community. And I just want to thank her personally for all the great work that she's done for us. Thank you, Commissioner. Any other comments? Well, thank you again. See, this next part is also um, an award, if you will, that we get to do periodically. And these are the Public Health Champion Awards, what I used to call the Public Health Heroes Awards. <laughs> and we have um, three this month, uh, Lori Sego and uh, Diana May and uh, the entire Emergency Incident Support Team. And I think there's a number of you back here. so. Susan, would you mind making some comments about about these three award winners? Sure. Um, as, as everyone has heard time and time again, public health, um, we accomplish our work through partnerships and collaboration, and we have um, many numerous different heroes and public health champions in the community, and we have three um, um, areas that, that we're going to recognize today. And um, after we recognize each um, public health champion, then I'll ask you to come up here and say a few words if if you uh, would like to. And then after that, then we'll take photos um, with Board of Health, Board of Health members. And so the first um, public health champion award, um, Lori Sego, if you could come up please. Lori Sego um, has been supporting um, public health as our attorney for, I believe, um, 11 or 13 years, Lori. Oh, you probably it won't feel like that, but it's probably like six or six. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, it's probably You've been like twice this, as busy. This, this, this yeah. past year. And um, Lori um, has just done a tremendous job um, pre COVID mm -hmm. on so many different matters that include public health and, and the Board of Health. But this past year has been um, incredible. And, and um, you know, we, we joke a lot because um, we're used to everyone who's been in the response, you know, texting, calling multiple times, night or day, weekends, um, and um, just, just getting the, the job done. And Lori, um, in the beginning of the COVID response, if you remember how many policy changes there were, um, and we also faced a lot of the unknown. And Lori was um, our attorney that was helping to translate all of the policies to help us understand what it meant here locally so then we can in turn inform the business community and all of the entities that that um, were impacted like um, you know what what are the requirements and and not necessarily so we have the communicable disease 
um, you know, Ari and, and the data team, but from a, a legal perspective, really trying to understand what does this mean so we can provide good, accurate information and be very responsive, whether, you know, through different different platforms. And, um, you know, we had a lot of technical questions um, and, and Lori supported us through that. And another key area was when we went through um, um, variances to help businesses allow for more gradual opening or to loosen the restrictions beyond what um, the, the state had required. And Lori helped lead all of those variances. And um, there was different multiple sectors, you know, going to the Board of County Commissioners or whether it was City Council, um, Colorado Springs City Council, and um, helping to navigate all of that um, for us. And so that was tremendous. And if that's not enough in a pandemic, um, she helped us, the Board of Health, with a purchase of a new building in um, Southeast um, El Paso County. And I know when I went to Dr. Turbish with the idea, she's like, you, what, what are you thinking, Susan, <laughs> um, in a pandemic? But it's like, we, we need this. Um, and Lori is the person that navigated, you know, all of the real estate um, rules and, 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 and really um, um, uh, not supported, supported the Board of Health, but really um, led, led that effort with all of the, the paperwork and, and the rules and um, all of those details. And that was phenomenal, Lori. Um, and, and I can't tell you how much paperwork she's went through for communication for me. I'm to, on my desk, I mean, there was always um, lots of uh, communication my way, and she handled all of that. Um, and uh, you're just phenomenal. So you are our public health champion. And Mary Ritchie is is now our attorney, and she's transitioning, and, and Lori's going to be um, working on some other aspects of the county. But um, you are a public health champion, um, and we just appreciate um, all of the work that, that you've done on behalf of the board and, and for our, our team. So thank you. Let me add to that, Lori, because I, I, I personally benefited from from your expertise and, and service. And, you know, I haven't bought a commercial building before, <laughs> at least at least not like that. And this whole process of going through uh, the, the purchase of that uh, uh, building in Fountain and Southeast for our um, additional site for a public health department uh, turned out to be genius. And uh, I always knew it was important to have a lawyer by your side to avoid the missteps, but it, it never became more clear to me than through this uh, episode uh, in, uh, in purchasing the building, how, how, how important it was step by step. And, and Barry, I'm sure it was tedious, but uh, the detail and the uh, let's think about this. I just really appreciate you and, and uh, all the trouble that you helped us avoid and uh, from your dedication. So thank you. We really do appreciate you. Thank you. <clears throat> and I don't know. Any other board this. member comments? If, if not, go ahead, Lori, please. Um, thank you very much. I, I, this means a lot to me. Um, when I first started representing public health about six or seven years ago, it was during a time when public health was transitioning from private outside council to um, receiving the services of the county attorney's office. So I was the first attorney to do that. Um, and fortunately, I think it's gone pretty well. And I think we've built a pretty strong partnership um, between my office and uh, public health, the agency, as well as the board of health. Um, so I'm pretty proud of that. Um, it, it it's truly been it's been a tremendous learning experience. It's truly been a privilege, particularly during the pandemic, to help those that are doing the actual work. I just any small part I could play, I'm I'm really privileged and humbled to have done that. Um, and I just want uh, Susan and Deanne and the Board of Health to know that I've worked for the county for since 1998, and the passion that your staff has for the services they provide and the compassion that they have for those that they serve is unmatched. And it's just been a real privilege. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
<laughs> and so um, Diana May, for, for those that, that do not um, know her or haven't had the pleasure, she serves as El Paso County's um, attorney and she she leads the um, county attorney's office and I've um, ha had so Boys many interactions off. with, Boys over off. with um, Diana over the years and much more so during the past 15 months <clears throat> and um, Diana is a an amazing um, leader. She is so strategic, very responsive, always there. It does not matter if it's 6 a.m or 11 p.m. Um, and, and these are not small issues. These Sounds are like you. <laughs> uh, the, uh, um, you know, issues that, that we bring forward, um, they're, they're not small and, and they're, they're, um, they're significant and, and now we have to work through. But um, Diana has taken the initiative um, with our response to, to not be reactive but to uh, be a leader and she has helped initiate our schools group which um, is also led by our community disease team um, Haley uh, Zachary as well as um, Jenny Best and, and uh, Deanne Ryberg and um, that's you know with 17 different school districts and also charter schools um, that that's enormous and to navigate all of that. And um, she she has not skipped a beat, but she has really um, been so strategic and so helpful. And also um, many numerous times our liaison also with some of the um, superintendents and then also initiating um, meetings with the governor's office and the chief of staff um, for El Paso County's voice, a voice to be heard. But, uh, you know, whether it's uh, variances or being there for, um, businesses or athletic clubs um, or uh, the jail or the court system. Um, another area that that I, I forgot to mention with with Lori um, that that also Diana helped um, spearhead for us is um, putting a a uh, procedure together to work um, on enforcement. And so we outlined that um, Diana helped call all of the police chiefs from all of the different municipalities municipalities and towns and, um, and cities within El Paso County, as well as um, the district attorney's office, the sheriff's office. And we developed um, a process of heavily focused on educating um, the community that are, that are affected, the businesses and providing technical assistance. Because if you can imagine that someone's livelihood is being so affected and helping them interpret, you know, what you know, what what do we need to do here? Um, and then enforcement as a last resort. But she she helped us out with um, with all aspects of that. Um, but I, I can't say enough um, <clears throat> about Diana's leadership, her her uh, her initiative, uh, her strategic input. Um, I, I have never worked um, with someone, um, you know, on the legal front um, of Diana's caliber. Um, and I, I just I can't say enough of wonderful things about you. And I will say, Yolanda, that, um, you know, you and I were recognized as, as women of influence by the Congress for Business. Diana was as well um, back. I don't know what year it was, but she, she was recognized as a, a woman of influence. But you're you're amazing, Diana. And and we could not navigate our agency um, without you, um, your leadership and your team um, because it I don't know if there's been over 100 different policies and changes and um, navigating but um, we we could not do it without you so thank you and I don't know if anyone else I do I have a <laughs> Hi, Diana. well good morning you know my previous interactions with uh, uh, lawyers and it's been uh, <laughs> it's interesting that, that we have uh, uh, recognized two of our great attorneys here this morning but but my interactions were were typically in the in the, along the line of well maybe we have a problem here and I'd, I'd get a response sometimes well it depends you know but but Lawyer not answer. you not you you um, uh, bring up uh, things that we hadn't even thought of and in fact my interaction with you has typically been well have you thought about this Dr. Sherbush well have you thought about that and. I would say the, the word that most closely typifies what you've done for the Board of Health 
and for our health department is to anticipate, anticipate problems, anticipate what we could do uh, on a formal uh, level, uh, on a helpful level. And I just really appreciate that, that you've helped open my eyes to new opportunities and I've learned from you. And so I just also want to sincerely say thank you for all the great work that you've done for the health department and specifically also for the Board of Health. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Yes, <laughs> Kevin, please. Thank you. Um, you know, and this goes for, for you and Lori. Um, I have the privilege of, of working very closely with you on um, with you and with Lori on multiple projects for the county and your official title is um, the county attorney. Um, and I think in the last year, I always knew you were that, um, but in the last year, you actually became all of El Paso County's attorney. <laughs> um, and the way that you and your team um, came alongside our businesses, um, you know, we felt like um, as, as the Board of Health and as county commissioners, we felt like you were always right there to help us. But I have heard feedback that the businesses that you interacted with, the schools that you interacted with, the uh, graduation ceremonies you helped put together and plan, the Olympic Museum opening, um, all of those people felt like you were theirs too. And you um, you have indeed just uh, gone above and beyond. And um, I'm just, I'm, I'm so proud of you. I'm so excited for you. Um, and, and really, uh, I, I know you well enough to know that you're also about to defer a lot of things to your team. <laughs> so, um, I, I mean, I I know that uh, you have rallied them um, and rallied that Lori and everybody in your office has uh, has picked up different projects and somehow touched um, COVID public health response in some way, somehow, every single attorney in your office. So um, thank you for that. Thank you for um, building a team that was flexible enough to, to do that, um, flexible enough to let you carry the things that you needed to carry. Um, and I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm really um, excited. This is a well-deserved, thank you, yeah. public health champion. Other, other Board of Health member comment, please. Go ahead and just raise your hand. That's about the only way we can tell. Um, Virtually. Okay. Do you see one? No? Okay. Diana, please. Well, Cami knows me well. Um, you know, th thank you for, for recognizing me. It means a lot, uh, a lot to me. But um, although I you're recognizing me, you, I feel like you're recognizing our office and you're recognizing kind of the effort that we've put in, whether it be, um, you know, changing resources up a little bit, thinking a little bit outside the box, being available whenever is needed. Um, a little funny, I kind of sometimes have a dry sense of humor, but every, Michelle's gonna smile, she knows what I'm gonna say. So we started getting into calling Friday, I called it Seagull Friday. <laughs> <laughs> we would get public health orders that would drop on Friday at five, six in the evening and businesses were scrambling. And so, it, it's just been such a team effort from Michelle to Deanne to to Susan to, um, you know, your communicable disease team. I mean, everyone has just pulls together to make um, public health in El Paso County shine. And that's what happened. The hardest part I've ever had in 24 years working for the county has been the, the most stressful time is, is this during the COVID time. I'm trying to, you know, do the right thing, manage the office, meet the client's needs, but it's also been one of my most rewarding times and and the most rewarding part for me has been working with you all in the community on schools. Um, I've always had a soft spot in my heart for kiddos and education and extracurricular activities. Uh, my team's, my son's lacrosse team just won state last night. So um, keeping kids, you know, I know sometimes, you know, it didn't seem like a priority, but sports, extracurricular activities, graduations, proms, those are the things that make a difference for these kiddos. Their mental health is just as important as their educational health. And you all in public health came right along with the whole team. Your school's team's amazing. Haley and Jenny have been fantastic. I, do, I know I saw Haley earlier, but 
Haley and Jenny were great. And um, thank you for letting me be part of your team. I was honored on how much you guys opened your arms and welcomed my, well, have you ever thought about or what about? And and even I think I would say sometimes, OK, I know this is a little bit outside my legal lane, but what do you think about? And so thank you for always being able to um, have an open mind and welcome the suggestions and in partnering with the county attorney's office. So thank you. Thank you. OK, and EIS. Right, incident, um, emergency incident support, EIS. Um, Mary Williams, if you want to come up, but you can all come up um, if that's so. OK, I think we probably have enough room over here. Then we'll we'll take your the, I'll do the, the photos. we'll do yeah. the EIS photo first yeah. after we recognize yeah. um, them as well. So um, EIS is a group of volunteers organized through the Pikes Peak Regional Office of Emergency Management to support organizations in responding to disasters or other emergency situations. Most recently, they fed all of our staff working at um, 20 of our COVID-19 vaccine points of dispensing from February 19th through May 14th. During this time, 126 EIS volunteers worked over 1,000 hours to serve El Paso County Public Health. They spent hours preparing homemade lunches and served all points of dispensing workers um, nearly 2,000 total um, during uh, 20 points of dispensing. In person, always with smiles on their face. Um, the delicious food and hospitality was a bright spot during the long and often taxing points of dispensing days. And we are extremely grateful for um, your and your, your team support. And I do know that I have heard comments that um, the food is just really uh, comforting and amazing. And I know when I went to the, the points of dispensing, actually at the um, the, the South County uh, building, we we're calling it South um, Public, El Paso County Public Health, that I was just really greeted just with so much warmth. Um, and I want to say it almost brought me to tears um, to know that people care that much. And I would bring to tears now because everyone has worked so hard and um, we appreciate you and your support, you lifting us up through just the food and just um, with smiles and just just so much warmth. So so thank you so much. And I'm going to ask um, my deputy director, Deanne Ryberg, to say a few words. She served as the emergency center coordination director um, with with our teams and um, like to give her an opportunity to say a little bit, too, because she was highly engaged in, in all of the uh, points of dispensing as well. Thank you, Susan. And I want to echo those sentiments of gratitude for everything that you and your team have done. When we um, first opened our doors for our points of dispensing at our south location, there was so much that needed attention and needed to be done to be able to serve um, a mass vaccination event for the community and make that successful. And uh, your team really uh, was a force multiplier for us by being there to take care of the food, take care of our teams. We had the opportunity to focus our efforts where they needed to be focused and also have that comfort of knowing that there were people there who cared about what we were doing and were there to support us to make that successful. And I know it has meant a tremendous amount to our team when they go in there and early in the morning for those um, pre-day briefings and your team makes it so easy for us. There's breakfast, there's a warm welcome, and we're ready to start our day on a positive note. So um, on behalf of our team that staffed those events, we would just like to express our, our gratitude for making such a positive impact on those long uh, vaccination days and making them a success for us. Thank you. Thank you. Super. I don't know if any other board member has any comments. Board, board of Health member comment. Go ahead and raise your hand out there no well maybe michelle could organize this we have a photo op right sure mary would you like to say anything before we yeah. get started yeah so um emergency incident support is an all-volunteer organization in el paso county and uh, we serve the first responders and so we serve law enforcement fire uh, active shooter events, um, 
uh, we have supported the FBI and the Secret Service when they have been here. And uh, and when COVID came along, we viewed public health as a first responder. And, um, and we also view um, great food as being a tremendous morale and support to the first responders. And uh, and we we like to be really engaged with the first responders. And it was a a little bit of a challenge, but we, we have served in forests and in snowstorms and in rain and all kinds of environments, but we've never provided a hundred meals to uh, first responders in a facility where there was no stove and no oven. Uh, so, um, so that was one of our uh, big challenges. And and we, our goal was to provide great food and to welcome and support um, the uh, people who are, were at the clinic. And it's it's our honor to support you and we are always here to support you and uh, I would like to recognize the team of people many of them were there at six o'clock five o'clock in the morning and all night cooking food to make sure that we were taking care of you and it was our honor to do that and we are always here for you thank okay. you Mary, could we do a photo of you accepting the award and then we can do a group shot too? So we can have board members. We'll do the backdrop over here today. Okay. So, Mary, if I could have you we'll take in probably the a, like a five to seven minute break for photos. All right. If I show you in the middle and you want board members. Okay, board members. Please. Oh, right. See. Public health hero. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, let me scooch on this one. Yeah. Yeah, and could you go next to Dr. Turbush? Perfect. Um, I got it. Yep. <laughs> Let me see. We might need to squish a little bit more. Want to go side? So we're not always in. on the side. Do you want us to squeeze in or what? Yeah, I think, yeah, I think I'm just. <laughs> With that, we should. Right, you can squeeze closer to me, Yolanda. A little bit. <laughs> Puma does not look too thrilled about that. All right, and then we'll just go ahead and take several. Perfect. <laughs> All right, perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you very so much. And then we need to get her. Team. Mary's team, yeah. yeah. Let's, yes. let's have board members. You guys want to come up and turn I have background? the EIS team, please. Yay. You guys might do a couple of rows. Any, anything you can do. We're here for you. Thank you. Let's see. So you guys might have to do two. We might have to do two rows for this. Oh, we do. Remember those having you up for a little bit? I'm so glad someone's for the And then, sir, can I have you on the other side? Perfect. And can you guys shift a little bit to the left? 
Scooch down a little bit more. Sometimes it is very tempting, but <laughs> you guys all need to pee on this. Yes, there you go. There you go. Bees behind this. There you go. Good job. Perfect. All right, that should. Okay, good. All right, I think we have everyone. So I will take a several of these. And then Mary, I can grab your contact info and send you these. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Perfect. And Mary, you had one more announcement, right? Oh, yes. Um, so it's our tradition. Where are they? <laughs> it's our tradition wherever we go to um, pass out Skittles. Yeah. And so we have Skittles for uh, And uh, we started this, uh, we started doing this at the fire departments and then the police heard about it and they wanted it. And then the sheriff heard about it and he wanted it. So, oh, <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Right, <laughs> 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 Just a little bit. It's so you know, they grow up. All right. Oh, I didn't expect you to say Jeep. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
And that's one of the uh, one of the happiest things we get to do. Let me just comment for the board members' sake. Thank you, Anna, Lori. Thank, thank you. you. Appreciate you. Uh, Mary Williamson from EIS commented several times that our our public health staff are our first responders, and I think it's important that we. Uh, Put stop that, that we reinforce that for the benefit not only of our staff, but for others out here who might look at public health as, as doing some other things, which we do. But we really want to be and are in that category of first responders, and it becomes increasingly evident that this is, this is what we do. So uh, along with the uh, police, fire, ambulance, and others in the emergency response uh, community, our public health staff are right there with you. So thank you. Um, we have a, an action item here, approval of minutes. Uh, the uh, May 26th Board of Health minutes are in your packet and you've had a chance to look at them. I would entertain a motion to approve. Yolanda, move to approve. Thank you, Yolanda. And a second? Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. There we go. Now, an audit presentation here, the 2020 audit presentation. And uh, Nikki, who's going to be doing that? Is that you? You're going to do it? All right. You know, we normally, I mean, in most places, we're working until quite, quite a bit later in the year. So mm -hmm. this, is, uh, this is terrific. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning. Nikki Simmons, El Paso County Controller. Um, so I'm here this morning uh, just to introduce Ted Williamson, who is the audit partner with Ruben Brown. Um, he's actually in St. Louis today, so he's presenting remotely through Microsoft Teams. Um, but he's going to go through the results of the audits and require communications to the Board of Health about how the audit went, the results of it. And I don't want to steal a lot of his thunder, uh, but I'm really excited about these results. Um, very clean audit, no adjustments were made, no findings. And, and the reason that's so important is that it means that the financials that you all get all year long from our staff are accurate. Um, we're giving you accurate information, timely information. We're not having relying on the auditors to come in and kind of clean up our financial statements. Um, we have a huge, uh, have a huge appreciation for the uh, accounting and finance staff, budget staff that support public health. There's a large crew of people who um, you don't see on a daily basis. They're not in this building. They work downtown for financial services. Um, who support public health directly on a daily basis. Um, and so I wanted to uh, point out, uh, Debbie Perry is here. Uh, she's our finance division manager and she oversees our accounting groups. Um, and then specifically Jody Pinnell and her group of accountants that they know accounting standards in and out. So this isn't as exciting as awards and things like that, but we're actually really excited about the results of this audit. Um, and um, this report has been given to all Board of Health members as well as it's available, it'll be available on our website, open for public inspection. Um, if anybody has any questions, this also included a full federal audit of all the federal funds you received last year, which was significant <laughs> and continues to be significant. Um, so just wanted to pass on uh, appreciation for the staff and uh, introduce Ted. So Ted. Good morning. Can you hear me? Good morning, Ted. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you for having me this morning and thank you for the introduction, Nikki. Again, my name is Ted Williamson. I'm a partner with the accounting firm of, firm of Ruben Brown. We did the audit of the uh, public health department for the year ended December 31st, 2020. As Nikki mentioned, we're uh, pleased to report that everything went smoothly and that we did issue a uh, what's called an unmodified or a clean opinion on the financial statements. Uh, we did most of our field work took place in uh, late March with some follow up work in April and May. And the final reports were uh, just issued earlier in June. And throughout the process, we received uh, good cooperation from management and all of the books and records were in good order. Um, as Nikki mentioned, there are two parts to the audit. One is the audit of your financial statements themselves. And then secondly is what's called a single audit, which is a compliance audit uh, related to the federal uh, grants that the organization receives and expense. 
So on the financial statement audit, um, again, we're pleased to report that that uh, we're, we issued a clean or unmodified opinion. We did not identify any uh, audit adjustments or corrections that had to be made to the numbers uh, during our audit. Um, it's not uncommon for us on any audit to at least have a couple of adjustments that we've identified. So the fact that there were none shows how well the records are maintained. We also did not identify any material weaknesses or significant deficiencies in internal control. Um, and we did not have any uh, difficulties or disagreements with management uh, throughout the process. Additionally, in some years, there are new accounting uh, standards issued by the Governmental Accounting Standards Board that have to be implemented. But fortunately, this year, there were no such new standards that had to be implemented. Most of those have been deferred due to the pandemic. So it was that made the audit go a lot more smoothly this year, not having to uh, implement any major changes. And then on the single audit, uh, which is again the grant compliance audit, uh, we looked at two programs, the coronavirus relief funds uh, that were received, as well as the public health emergency preparedness program. And we did not find any instances of non-compliance or have any findings as a result of the single audit as well. So in summary, I think uh, you'd agree with me that that things went very smoothly and, and you should be pleased with the results. Any board member questions? Well, thank you. And, and particularly, uh, I guess, notable during uh, such a year of upheaval and rapid change that uh, it all came out. Uh, so thank you. Thank you for that report. Nikki? Um, I don't have any further comments except for um, I did mention we presented the county audit to the uh, commissioners yesterday. I'll mention the same thing. We are going to uh, submit this uh, financial report to the Government Finance Officers Association for consideration of uh, for an award for excellence in financial reporting. Uh, we received it last year um, and uh, we're one of very few public health departments that submit in the entire nation for that. So uh, we're hopeful to receive that again. We believe that this report will receive that award um, and we're we're excited about it. So very well done. So thank you. You might be the only public health submitted yeah. this year. <laughs> Nikki, is it not true that not only this is this an, a, an exceptional uh, audit? but that is completed much earlier than than is typical. You know, I don't know another, uh, I, I can't, I guess I can't speak to that because I don't know. Um, we do it earlier, I, you know, it's, we get it done in sometime in May. Um, this was issued June 14th, just because we have to issue it before the counties. Um, the statutory deadlines for things uh, sometimes are in September. Um, it, when you work in corporate accounting, closures are a little bit earlier. Governmental accounting takes a while because there's a lot of standards to do with uh, pension and it takes a long time. So we rely on a whole bunch of other audits to get done before we're able to issue the final government audit. Um, and so it takes long. That's what delays it. But yeah, really, like this is done earlier than we're statutorily required to get it done. So well done. We're very excited about that. I, I think you're still up there, or or you and Lori, right? Um, Lori Clayton is going Lori to is handle the okay. financials today. Great, thank you. So the next action, thank you very much. Our next action item is finance and budget, and we have Lori Clayton who's going to talk to us about quite a few things. First of all, the May 2021 financial summary. Right. Lori, Good. are you out there? I I am here. Thank you. Okay. Good morning, okay. Board of Health. Um, today I'm bringing forth the uh, May 2021 Public Health Financial Report. And there it is there on the screen. Um, first off, for the revenues, they're kind of trending as we've been seeing the past few months, um, other than the program specific grant revenue. They've been or coming if you in. Could speak up. I'm sorry, if you could speak sure. up just a little a little bit. It's kind of sure. garbled on our end. Okay, sorry about that. Um, for the revenues, other than the uh, program specific grants revenue. They've been coming in as we've been seeing throughout the year a little bit low um, with the program specific grant revenue um, it, it is coming quite a bit low to budget and as we've been seeing and as expected much of that is due to the resources dedicated to COVID-19 response efforts over the last year and we have been receiving funding as we've discussed in prior months to uh, cover that response so overall there's no concerns that we have for revenue in general 
Um, for the expenditures, as you can see here, we're showing significant underspending in both personnel and operating uh, compared to budget. And currently overall, uh, revenues less expenditures, we're showing a positive net impact to budget of $983,912. And this is without spending any uh, reserves at this point. So that's, that's kind of where we are through May. Are there any questions at all on the financials? Questions from board members about uh, our um, May 2021 financial summary. I don't see any, Lori. Go ahead. OK, great. Thank you. Um, next, we are bringing forth a resolution to recognize revenue and appropriate expenditures in the amount of two million one hundred ninety six thousand two hundred and thirty five dollars. And this is for the national initiative to address COVID-19 health disparities. And I believe uh, Carolyn Gary and Jordan Linder will be giving a quick overview of the funding and its intended uses. Great. Great, please. Welcome, Carolyn and Jordan. Hello, everybody. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here in person today. Um, we are really pleased to give some background information today about um, some wonderful funding that we have received. I am Carolyn Gary. I'm the development officer. And I'm Jordan Linder, the grants coordinator. And um, this funding really directly targets the disproportionate impact that COVID-19 had within certain sectors, within certain population groups throughout um, the nation. So specifically, uh, the funding was awarded to states and also to health agencies, dependent upon the size um, of the area served, as well as a vulnerability index. Um, because of our size, we did receive funding. Um, Denver Public Health also received funding, as did the State Department of Health. So what we are receiving is approximately 2.2 million. Um, and the funding exactly is $2,196,235. Um, and the funding period will be from July 2021 through May 2023. Um, and I already mentioned um, how we became eligible for this funding. Jordan and I did have the opportunity to meet um, with the Colorado Department of Public Health to really look at what our funding focal areas would be, um, because we will also be able to partner on some of their effort as well. Um, one of the major um, components of this funding is looking at health equity. Uh, one of the activities that was suggested within the application was to look at uh, creating a health equity office at the executive leadership level. So this funding does have um, a huge impact on health equity. There will be the creation of that position uh, of a health equity officer, as well as uh, funding to target professional development related to that effort. Um, and also, this is going to be a great um, opportunity given where we are um, with the Community Health Improvement Plan and really looking um, at uh, that planning process as well. So, Jordan, do you want to take it? Yeah, and so the funding will also expand our um, relationships with our external partners to make sure we're cultivating those. We have a good read on what our community needs as we develop those next strategic um, plans, the Community Health Improvement Plan. Next slide, please. Um, and then one thing we're really excited about, we have budgeted for nine part-time community navigators. So these are going to be, you know, individuals that are trusted within their areas of the community to really provide for those um, individuals, those communities, and see what their needs are to report back to us. So there's more of the coordinated care model and that we're really understanding, you know, what impact of COVID-19 has been specifically to different populations. Next slide. Um, and then also, you know, continuing with the momentum of our data and analytics team with the dashboard, making sure that, you know, we are the trusted source of data for public health as a county. So increasing their um, infrastructure, their capacity to continue those um, gains with our data um, and analytics department. And next slide. 
And then you can see this kind of our big overview of the budget. Most of the funding will be going to personnel to you know, increase our capacity infrastructure um, and just uh, the other things that go along with that. So excited about that addition. And if there's any questions. I have a question. So if it's 2.2 million uh, and it's just till um, it ends on May uh, 2023, what happens to those positions? Do they go away after that? That's a great question. Um, one of the things too that I've been monitoring legislatively um, is that there has been a lot of discussion to introduce uh, legislation at the federal level to continue this kind of funding. Um, but knowing that we will be looking at that um, point in time, we've already as the development office have been actively engaged to ensure that the, there will be continuity within those positions. So looking at sustainability with other grant opportunities. I'd like to say something. So, I mean, I, I think that that's a, a great question related to a population our size. How are we going to um, continue with the public health infrastructure here at the local level? And so that's something that, that we'll continue to advocate for, not only at the federal level, the state level and the local level. The good news um, that happened um, a couple of weeks ago that um, our state legislature um, approved um, additional core funding coming from the state for three years and that will there it's on a population basis and the core funding the, the um, beauty about that is that it's for core funding it's not specific um, to certain requirements and, and um, as it's it's restricted for grants and so that funding will be utilized um, agency wide to continue with our public health infrastructure but that's only three years so it, it can we, we continue to put the puzzle pieces together as it relates to funding to have um, uh, what I say would say the, the most valuable asset here at local public health is the team it's it's, it's our team it's our expertise um, we know what to do we know how to do it um, but we need the staffing and as a refresher or a reminder um, a population our size should have 200 mm -hmm. and 69 full-time employees um, according to the National Association of City and County Health Officials, which they do an assessment all of the, the time. And our steady state um, is 158 um, full-time employees. And that's after the Board of County Commissioners approved additional funding to hire the 10 additional staff. Now with the COVID funding, and, and this is, you know, th there's so many different funding um, streams and timelines and that's where I really depend on um, Nikki and her crew that you know some of it goes through um, 2022, 23, 24 and 25 but it, it's it's really a matter of how do we focus on um, priority areas which the health disparities is and that that um, um, equity officer and then how do we piece piece that funding together and I would always say um, it's a work in progress. Um, and, and that it, it continues to be, but um, um, at least we're, we're, we're getting more, um, more of it, it started and, and funded through the, through the CDC grant. Yeah, because I love this, you know, the equity officer and is it nine? Um, what are, Community I, I think about uh, Roma, <laughs> Roma Thomas, Thomas, right? Yeah. 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 The people that are on the ground, right, in the trenches, and I, I think that's really excellent, but sometimes it takes a year or two to get your sea legs, and then I would hate them that to stop. When it, so anyway, so yeah. that's good. We have to keep an eye on that to make sure that it's always funded. Yeah, and, and I think um, that the good news is that we've been focused on this for um, so many years as a public health agency that we continue to enhance and build um, our efforts because we we did hire a health equity um, planner or educator planner a planner with the additional funding that the county commissioners had had provided but it's it's just it's it's just always a work in progress and in trying to keep up the momentum and, and continuing to build and build and um, Yolanda too I know you'll be a um, um, still connected and, and help us out with this this area um, also. Hey, I, had, I had a quick question if, if it's okay. Um, Carolyn, I think in your introductory comments you mentioned that uh, Denver County, CDPHE, and El Paso County received this 
this recognition and the grant money. Is that is that right? Is that, that is correct. So all other agencies throughout the state will be served through the funding that the Colorado State Department of Public Health received. But we received our own unique funding through um, this grant. Well, I'd be interested after the meeting to find out how you did that. And I'm I'm very glad that we have a development officer on the staff here. So thank you. Well done. Other board of health comments about this. Um, and we have a resolution to read, right? Commissioner Bremer, Commissioner Bremer please. Thank you. My heart is pounding. I'm going to bring up a tougher question. I think this stream is is wonderful, well needed. Um, and but following on to um, Councilwoman Avila's questioning about um, actually, are you able to go back to that pie chart? Um, thank you. Um, so if you take a look at this, 65% of the grant money is being used short term on personnel um, and eight and a half percent on contracted services. I I personally, um, I mean, I, I will not be a, a no vote on a wonderful resolution and accepting and allocating wonderful funds, but I personally would like to have seen that uh, percentage of contracted services and working with our partners in the community, um, forging ahead with with good public private partnerships and the groundwork's already laid in a lot of ways for that. Um, I would much rather see a larger piece um, of the pie be to that and a smaller piece on the um, personnel. Um, that being said, I, I know I know we're understaffed and I know we can't put any more extra work on those employees that we have. Um, so that's just it's just my thought, um, but it's a perhaps. Um, you know, I, I recognize that I don't know all the details, all the requirements of the specific uh, grant requirements and whatnot um, from the state. And of course, we will accept and allocate today with a yes vote from me. But my preference would be, can we find some creative ways to work with our nonprofit community, our partners and, and contract um, some of those services and establish long term relationships that maybe once we know there are more permanent funding streams um, could could be brought in house. Um, that would be my preference. Sounds like an opportunity for another grant request. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it sounds like to me. OK, good. Any other? I'm not doing very well on seeing hands out there uh, today. Uh, any other Board of Health member comments about this before we read the resolution? No, OK, I don't want to skip over anybody. All right. Well, why don't you stand up there while we read the don't don't <laughs> run away yet. Um, this is uh, a resolution to recognize revenue and appropriate expenditures for contract funding effective today. Uh, the resolution to recognize revenue and appropriate expenditures in the amount of two million one hundred ninety six thousand two hundred thirty five dollars for the national initiative to address COVID-19 health disparities among populations at high risk and underserved, including racial and ethnic minority populations and rural communities grant as contracted with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention uh, for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. The acronym is ATSDR. Whereas CDC slash ATSDR will provide El Paso County Public Health with funding in the amount of $2,196,235 to address COVID-19 related health disparities and advance health equity by expanding state, local, U.S. territorial, and freely associated state health department capacity and services. The funding will be effective June 1, 2021 through July 31, 2023. The funds will be received in a lump sum in June of 2021 and any unspent funds from the current year will be reappropriated to the following year. And whereas the strategy of this funding is to expand existing and or develop new mitigation and prevention resources and services to reduce COVID-19 related disparities among populations at higher risk 
and that are underserved to increase and improve data collection and reporting for populations experiencing a disproportionate burden of COVID-19 infection, severe illness and death to guide the response to the COVID-19 pandemic and to build leverage and expand infrastructure support for COVID-19 prevention and control among populations that are at higher risk and underserved. And whereas the activities in this funding will provide the means necessary for El Paso County Public Health to focus their efforts on vaccine coordination, quarantine and isolation options and preventive care and disease management among populations that are underserved and at higher risk for COVID-19 and individuals who need to isolate or quarantine during COVID-19 and whereas El Paso County Public Health will identify housing, food, and other barriers that individuals face when isolating to protect their family and community, and will also identify and establish collaborations with critical partners affiliated with populations at higher risk, and whereas the focus of the racial and ethnic population will include Black or African American, Hispanic or Latino, American Indian, Alaskan Native, Asian, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islanders, and also include people who are experiencing homelessness, incarcerated with disabilities, substance use disorders, living in congregate housing, non-US born, religious minority, and LBT, LGBTQ. And whereas the anticipated out outcomes will be reduced COVID-19 related health disparities, improved state, local, US territorial, and freely associated state health department capacity and, and services to prevent and control COVID-19 infection or transmission among populations at higher risk and that are underserved, including racial and ethnic minority groups and people living in rural communities, improved and increased testing and contact tracing among populations at higher risk and that are underserved, including racial and ethnic minority groups and people living in rural communities and expanded capacity to serve disproportionately impacted communities through targeted and strategic development of culturally and linguistically responsive communication tools and professional development. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the El Paso County Board of Health does hereby recognize revenue and appropriate expenditures in the amount of $2,196,235 to the El Paso County Public Health Department. Uh, and there and there is a, a listing of the breakdown of the dollars received. So it finishes uh, any discussion. You have the resolution in front of you. Board member questions, discussion? while we're still at this point. I do. Yes, please. Um, it doesn't exclude um, Caucasians because they could also be underserved if they're poor and have no education and all these kinds of things. Is that correct? It is correct. Just wanted to make sure that no one was excluded. No. Okay, thank you. Good, other board member questions? That was a good question, Lord. Other I'm, board member, yes. I'm excited. I think this is a really great opportunity good. to you know, serve the underserved and a lot of people that really impacted across the board by the pandemic. So. Yeah. yeah, this is something we can do to help focus the funding. Any other board member questions? I'll entertain an, uh, a motion to approve in a second. Move to approve. Okay. Second. All in favor? Aye. Okay, this resolution. Aye. All right. <laughs> I like that. Uh, that must have been Commissioner Longinos Gonzalez. <laughs> the others? <laughs> I'm going to state their preference. Okay. Any any uh, any nays? No. Any abstentions? Sounds like it was unanimous. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Now, this next part is one, two, three, four, five through ten contracts and I'm I'm really hoping that our board members have had a chance to look at these and uh, what I'd like to do is after a period of, of discussion approve these 10 in block. 
So we want anyone who's going to be speaking in favor of child fatality prevention services. These, if I could summarize our, uh, and Susan, correct me if I'm wrong, routine contracts that we uh, approve annually, correct? Yes. Okay. And well, let me just defer to you and, and ask, are there any, any questions about any of these 10 contracts and uh, issues that we should bring particularly to the attention of the board? You know, it's really um, disheartening to read about, you know, ch child fatalities. And, and I was wanting, not that I wanted, it sounds kind of morbid, but like examples of what, you know, the, the kids go through and how they end up, you know, in death. Are, are, are where the biggest chunks of are what are the biggest causes of, of child uh, fatalities? Yeah, I used to serve on that um, committee, and I know that we still have, um, in fact, our county uh, uh, corner serves on that, and they regularly meet and may discuss anywhere from, I don't know, three, four, five, or more sometimes cases uh, each month. Um, we had a great presentation at the Board of County Commissioners from our board. Maybe we like that. And I thought, I thought his breakdown of the, not just the child fatalities, but all the fatalities in the, in the county were, uh, was very clear and he explained it very well. Susan, yeah. comment? Sure. Uh, so, um, usually the, the case reviews are lagging, um, so they're not um, up to speed with um, some of the dates. However, with the concerns that, that we have around um, human suicide, that they um, have um, really expedited their schedule during, during the pandemic there. And there is a legislative report that is put out every year from all of the child fatality groups um, to uh, um, identify, you know, what are the top preventable um, deaths of 17 years of age or younger? And then more importantly, too, um, prevention strategies that, that, that we can use um, to uh, collectively work together in, in El Paso County. But um, I, uh, you know, believe that, you know, through Dr. Kelly's um, coroner report, that's that's a good report is, as well, but um, we still have um, a tremendous amount of concern um, as we should with what we're seeing with teen suicides. Um, that That is um, extremely concern, concerning and um, I know that um, we have um, concerns around um, um, sudden death syndrome um, and uh, Jan, I don't know if you have any more details on that, but um, those are kind of the, the, the top areas that, that stand out with 17 years of age and younger. Yeah, I, I, I remember reading, it's been several years, that children like like 10, below 10, have are committed suicide, or they really can't, um, they're not really sure if it's suicide or an accident, but they do really think it was suicide. But So I was just trying to figure out what it is that's taking our, our kids, and even younger than uh, teens. If there's any data on that, I was just curious about that. Yes, we 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 do have that. We can get very detailed. Yeah, um, there's an abundance of with, data with that. And Deanne, yeah. I, she oversees that the area, so I'd, I'd ask her if she has any more details. Okay, so, I don't want to take up all. I would welcome the opportunity, along with uh, Kelsey Leva, who's in the room, who serves as our um, our planner, who supports these efforts, to have an opportunity to uh, present more depth with the Board of Health regarding those efforts, because certainly the case reviews uh, cover a spectrum of uh, child fatalities from accidental to um, suicide and other contributing factors, and bring together a broad range of stakeholders to help inform what perhaps could be uh, interventions around preventable deaths to change that uh, for our community. So I think that to address it, we probably uh, would require a little bit more time to be able to unpack some of uh, the data and the contributing factors because over the course of a year we do review 
uh, a number of cases and they're not all the same and the cause of death um, is different across those case reviews. Yeah, committee I made reference to is the um, uh, CF child fatality review team. And uh, just speaking from personal experience, yes, there's some real heartbreaking uh, stories and, and difficult detailed assessments that go into that. So I'd welcome, I guess, on behalf of the board, an opportunity here from from CFRT again and uh, uh, listen to a presentation and, and hear about their work. Does that seem reasonable? Yes. OK. All right. Yes, Kami. Um, I think um, Susan pointed out very well um, there are concerns with kind of the teenage, the upper end of that um, uh, age group, uh, but um, what I've seen in in the cases that I'm also responsible for for reviewing um, in a different capacity um, is a, a very high risk pool of zero to two, um, which um, Deanne brought up as well. But I think um, that's that's where programs like some of our actually our other contracts on here, number seven specifically, the nurse home visiting program. Um, and others are prevention strategies based on what we do know about that zero to two age being um, high risk in certain situations. So I think, um, I mean, just to kind of summarize it, wrap wrap up all the other all the other programs that that the health department does. I mean, ultimately, I think some of the fatality review and data that we do get from that is driving the contracts that that we approve, um, and particularly today, one of those WIC program ones, um, the Nurse Home Visiting Program. So, um, and that's contract number seven. Yep. Uh, any Board of Health member comments or questions about any of the, the 10 contracts that we're likely to approve here in a couple of minutes? Board of Health member comments or questions? Speak right up. The discussion, the detail, the numbers are in your your packet. OK, I would entertain a motion to approve the 10 contracts. Um, in a second. Okay. Second. OK. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? OK, approved. Thank you. Um, we have um, number eight, which is hearing postponement. You know, this has been on our schedule a couple of times. And um, uh, to summarize, it's just not quite ready for prime time yet. I would additional, additionally comment that um, my opinion uh, is that if we, the health department, assess additional fees that will impact our community. There should be an, an appropriate and additional level of customer service that goes along with those fees. So um, that's where we're at. I think that the OWTS staff is, is looking at this again. I can't tell you when it's going to appear on our schedule uh, next, but they are doing some hard work to to uh, review all the various um, uh, regulations, fees, and services. Uh, comments? Yes. Yeah. No, thank you. And uh, we are working together with the OWTS um, program as well as um, our budget and finance uh, partners to review some of the activities that we will propose changing and also what that return looks like for the public that we serve and look Great. forward to bringing that detail forward. Great. OK, any comment? No. OK, we'll 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 see it again when we see it. Um, director's report. Director Whelan. Sure, we have a few things. Let's go ahead and start off with, um, as Yolanda calls them, the dynamic duo. All right. Stephen and Foddy, um, our chief uh, scientific uh, strategist and our epidemiologist. If I know that they were, um, you know, we're doing a, we have been doing a road show and they presented to the city of Fountain uh, Council last night. 
And um, if you want to give us a quick update and probably a update around the, the Delta and, and what, what that looks like and um, we'll go from there. Thanks very much. The Fadi and Stephen show here. So we can go ahead. Uh, first of all, I'd like to like to talk about a couple of milestones. We we've you've heard from us over a period of months and a year, but now the first thing is the most spectacular accomplishment when you think about vaccines, and we have an amazing set of version 1.0 vaccines out there. Uh, in six months, we've actually uh, inoculated, fully inoculated, more than half of the eligible population in El Paso County. So that's a testament to an amazing effort on the part of a manifold set of talents and people. So I, I don't want that to, to go by the wayside uh, because you're hearing the nation isn't going to make the 70 percent, uh, Colorado isn't going to make 75 percent, but 50 percent. And the number is actually a little bit above that, and that includes federal estimates. So that's a spectacular Great. accomplishment. And we're, we're, you know, we're seeing the results. Uh, the second thing is, is if you look at the state of Colorado, you look at El Paso County, uh, we were a little bit late to the show in terms of the decreasing cases across the nation, uh, but we are now actually at the lowest incidence rate since we've seen during the fall surge in the first week of October. So this is a pretty spectacular accomplishment. Our numbers, our one week incident numbers came down in early June to just above 100 and did not budge. We were very disappointed, but we've now gone below that. So that's another accomplishment. Generally, uh, the disease is a little bit in, in in retreat right now in the United States of America, uh, which is a pretty fascinating thing, and also in, in the state of Colorado. So that's the the since since October. So that's just an astonishing thing. So both of these are astonishing uh, things. Next slide, please. Uh, we wanted to update you about the correlation between uh, vaccination rates and incidents. Uh, El Paso County's incidence is going downward. In fact, uh, the last time we spoke, the last Board of Health meeting, we've uh, decreased by at least half of what it used to be during that meeting. So that, that's the good news. The cautionary news is that El Paso County's incidence remains higher than the other 10, the other nine uh, most populous counties. Uh, and we are seeing a bit of a correlation between counties that have higher vaccination rates and a lower incidence. Uh, so generally, everybody's moving in the right direction. El Paso County is a little bit slower than the other counties. And uh, for example, if we look at Boulder, their incidence right now is less than 10. They're in the single digits. Uh, so we want to make sure that our county alongside the other counties continue this uh, this downward dive. Next slide, please. And, and the final slide, uh, there's a couple of trends going on. We're actually at a point in time, again, in aggregate, the disease is moving down. We do believe that there's going to be a, a predictive value of the vaccination rates in terms of, of looking at disease. But remember, it's, it, if, if you look at different levels, you'll see different pictures. So across the United States of America, we're, we're going to see a, a puzzle forming. On one side right now in Colorado, the weather is on our side. So both the weather, improved ventilation, uh, it, it's, it's really good to help knock things down. Uh, the vaccinations and the previous natural immunity from infections are on our side. One of the things that's moving against us are the variants. And this is a picture, it's, it's quite a nice picture. It's just an example, it's a little bit hard to measure, but uh, recently WHO uh, renamed the way we talk about variants. So if you look on this slide, we're showing variants of concern. Uh, only in the last week or so has the CDC uh, added the Delta variant as a variant of a concern. Uh, if you recall, Alpha, uh, we used to know as the UK variant. Delta, we used to know as the Indian variant. And what you can see now, this is a picture from the state of Colorado. And what they're showing is, is they're actually taking some set of samples and, and uh, uh, sequencing them. So it's an imprecise image, but what we're seeing is very rapidly alpha had been the dominant uh, strain, uh, the dominant variant, but that dominance is now being threatened by the even more transmissible delta. And even though it's a little bit hard to measure, you've heard that it's delta is rapidly increasing. And in the state of Colorado, delta is well represented, uh, more so than in many states in the United States of America, and it is bound to become the <clears throat> dominant variant. Of course, the risk with, with Delta fundamentally is that it's more infectious, and that's that's how it's, it's dominating. So that is one of the things that's going against us. And again, the best protection against these variants is to be fully vaccinated, and that's why it's imperative that not only do we vaccinate as many people as possible, that they complete their course of vaccination. Uh, and uh, again, we mentioned earlier in the meeting about the state having a program to help try to complete the vaccinations and make sure everybody has access to both both doses. Again, the way that our vaccines have rolled out is we really have two two dose vaccines that are the most most common. So it's important that people receive both doses. 
Uh, the single dose vaccine is not in great supply, as you know, so we're not using it as much as before. Questions or? We, we promise to be brief. So, yeah, I have a question. We do. <laughs> Please go ahead. You know, in the fall, I know you're probably looking towards fall because we're going to encourage people to get their influenza vaccines, and their chemo vaccine, and all of those kinds of things. When do you expect that? Will it be like a year after, like when I've been vaccinated, that I'd get a booster? I mean, do you have an idea about how that's going to work? What the strategy is going to be to communicate that to the public and I think that's, that's a fantastic question and one that a lot of people are, are working on right now to understand, you know, whether or and when a boost of vaccination will be necessary. I don't think the science is settled yet, and there, there are a lot of uh, research programs right now trying to understand uh, how long, the, how, you know, how, how long the immunity is going to last from the vaccines and how the variants fare and whether or not the variants can be in breaking through the existing fleet of vaccines. So. I don't think we have an answer to that one yet. I had a question. If we could roll back one slide, please. Okay, this this is my least favorite slide, and you know I'm a chronic worrier. Yes. So uh, I think best guess, of course, is that uh, COVID-19 is seasonal, and we know that it does replicate more easily indoors and less easily out of doors. So in, 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 the, in the spirit of anticipating, what would you say is the likely circumstance? I know our incidence uh, is, is going down, but we still have a lot of our county that's not vaccinated. So uh, a large susceptible population. Right. Try, and, try and put on your, your, uh, your predictor hat here and tell us what it's going to be like in El Paso County in November if our percent of vaccination doesn't change. I think the key word there is a susceptible pool. Uh, we talked about the eligible population that has been vaccinated. Now we're flipping and we'll talk about the eligible population that could get uh, infected. Right. And the higher that number is uh, and the higher we're coming off, uh, the more people that will um, be susceptible. And unfortunately, uh, it, it is all about the numbers. We uh, are coming up on the July 4th deadline and we don't want to lose track of the effort and the accomplishments, but all it comes down to is the individual risk of uh, getting infected. And the more people we have in that pool, the higher that dot is going to be in, in the fall. Okay. And, and I think you're exactly right. If you think about the evolutionary, the way viruses work, it's a lot like a water leak. Mm -hmm. They're going to they're gonna find the most susceptible set of populations, and we are large, and this chart tells you we are susceptible. Yeah. So it's important that we continue our efforts to, to get people right. vaccinated uh, before the weather changes, the fall comes on, and we do anticipate that there'll be more disease because of moving indoors and, yeah. and exchanging. Thank you. I like your buttons, too. Yeah. Like, all right. Vaccinated. Yeah. <laughs> board member comments. Yes, Doris. Susan, at the last board meeting, we talked about um, the primary care physicians and other physicians, you know, trying to encourage their patients to get vaccinations. Has, what has been done on that yep. front anything yet i know it's only been a month since we met so mm -hmm. um because they were saying that some of the physicians themselves and healthcare workers were not wanting to get them and so i mean there was that conversation around that I don't know. dr vu if you have anything to share i don't have any new insights into that is a problem both in our practice and my observation outside of our practice and i don't have a good uh idea of how to fix that problem uh, has been vaccine has been av available for several months and most providers who have who are still hesitant uh, have had enough time to think about it and if there's still hesitance now I, there, there must be a good way I just don't know what the way is to convince those providers and, and, and you know what I've heard, you know, in some of the, the statewide calls that I've I've been on with um, primary care providers is that they were concerned about waste and some of the requirements. But now um, the state health department has come out and um, essentially said, don't worry about waste because there's enough supply. Mm -hmm. So you can puncture the vials. And if you have people that are interested in getting vaccinated, um, vaccinate them. And there are um, initiatives that are happening as it relates to educating the um, physician offices on um, uh, processes as it relates to um, 
engaging with with um, their clients to to get them vaccinated. And so those efforts are um, steady and, and they're going on. But I, I do think that um, that that's always a um, work in progress, too. And we know from some of the studies that have been um, shared that people trust their primary care provider offices. Um, and we've been increasing um, access to vaccine. That's been um, a major initiative throughout the um, county. And, and I think that, that we've been doing a, a very good job on that, but we know that there's not a one size that fits all. Um, so mass vaccination not, is not gonna work for everyone. So a um, close relationship with um, you know, your individual doctor and having that conversation um, you know, will be another area that, that I believe that people will um, seek out and be able to get access to the vaccine. And Diane's, or Deanne's going to talk a little bit about um, where um, the, the plans for mass vaccination, because there's going to be a, um, a um, devolving or um, demobilization of the World Arena mass vaccination on the 28th of this month. And um, so the last day for that mass vaccination site will be the 27th, but we have some other plans in the works. We're continually navigating and strategizing with our vaccine consortium on where to go, what tactics um, to, to utilize to provide um, vaccine, but to get innovative. And I think um, there's so many different ways that, that we have to work on, but that's something uh, working with provider offices will, will continue. Susan, if I may, uh one one factoid, 50% uh, of the population doesn't sound like much fully vaccinated, but that's more than 630,000 vaccines delivered individual doses, which is pretty amazing. And then also to your question about uh, time is on our side as more people become comfortable with watching vaccinations and the safety profiles become more evident and versus the risk of not being vaccinated. That's on our side. The other thing is that uh, when the vaccines become fully approved, and we do believe that that's going to be happening in the next several months, as well as the Moderna vaccine becoming potentially available for the younger people, which has a less restrictive cold chain. So these are all things that are going to play into availability of, of vaccinations. Thank you. When, when, when do you think it'll get the official approval? Which one? Um, <laughs> okay, well, the process for each of them, oh, Pfizer, no. Moderna. Yeah, so the full approval, both Pfizer was first uh, because they were the first vaccine. Have they been fully approved? They have not been fully approved. And that typically takes uh, several months, I mean, and during normal times, but these are not normal times, so we don't know what to expect. And then also Moderna just recently applied uh, after the close of their clinical trial with the 12th and up. Uh, age range. But again, the, those processes are sort of competing processes. And uh, I don't think we have any sense yet. Deanne, are you familiar with the latest on that? But we're talking months. A month? Yeah. Um, Before the, the fall? Uh, I, I, yeah, it's, it's hard to say. Uh, but uh, I think uh, there must have been a news article, but they're talking about three to five months. Um, but that all can change based on and then, then there's another one is, is is just approval in general for younger ages still. And that's that's a, a major uh, that will be a major breakthrough when that occurs. Of course, that's a much more challenging calculation, uh, you know, from from the standpoint of safety and recommendations. I think that will make a big difference. Make a huge difference. But so there are a lot of things moving in our favor. And generally, people mm -hmm. as time you know goes by, they start to understand there's more acceptance of, and, and the questions are getting answered and they're genuine questions. There are people who have genuine concerns and questions. <laughs> By the way, presently, most of our vaccinations are actually occurring in pharmacy, which is fascinating because people know about pharmacies and they're ubiquitous. So they're, they're getting their vaccines in pharmacies. Good. One more question. Let's see. Um, Ted Colas, please. Well, first of all, I want to thank uh, Fadi and Stephen. Uh, it's always fascinating to get their information. Um, and I appreciate the approach. Uh, th there's a lot of negative press about El Paso County only being in the 50s when other counties in the state are in the 70s. Uh, but the 50s in the amount of uh, 50 percentile in the amount of time that we have had this vaccine is truly a remarkable feat. And I appreciate the positive energy uh, going into recognizing that uh, while it might be lower than other counties, it's still very uh, high percentage in a short amount of time. That said, um, I think some of the hesitancy uh, with vaccination had to do with how rapidly these vaccines were developed. Um, now, though, we have had the vaccines in arms of people, myself included, for over six months. 
Um, we aren't seeing any negative outcomes. We're not seeing people getting sick or things like that. And that might be something that we can capitalize on now in another effort uh, to try to get a second wave to tell people, you know, after six months, we're not seeing these things that some folks were fearful of because of how fast the vaccine was uh, developed. And if we can uh, maybe come up with some statistics, uh, and I know that the statistics are out there uh, regarding how many people um, uh, the the illness, uh, lack of illness in those people who have been vaccinated, for one, uh, and for two, uh, the lack of any long-term side effects from the vaccine now that it's been uh, six months and growing, seven months um, uh, that, that it's been available to the general public, uh, that might encourage more people who have been hesitant uh, because of just how fast the vaccine was developed initially. No, I, I agree. That's a that's a really excellent point, and and, and we're, we're we're on the case. <laughs> well said, Ted. More diplomatic than I would have phrased it. <laughs> okay. Uh, any other? Yes, Cam. Sorry, I'll be super quick. Um, you know, I long before COVID we would have been looking at a very similar chart for El Paso County, like preschool child age vaccination rates. And we do know that El Paso County is is behind the curve and there's a tremendous amount of hesitancy in our county in particular on regular vaccinations that have long been around. So I feel like, I mean, yes, this is a scary chart um, as, you, as you said, but um, but I would guess that um, it's very similar in consistency to what we see with overall vaccine hesitancy in those that have been around for a long time among El Paso County residents. So I think this is just, a, to be honest with you, it's a continued conversation about how, how do we address overall vaccine hesitancy, not just the newest how do we think about vaccines? And, right, and that's a great point, if I, if I may. I mean, one of the challenges with vaccines is that when they're successful, they make the risk of disease fall away in your mind. So people simply look at the risk of, of side effect, which is extraordinarily low with well-designed vaccines, right, um, against the risk of doing nothing. And doing nothing, not getting vaccinated, is not a zero-risk decision. And so you're absolutely right, though, about it. <clears throat> So, okay. Um, well, Dr. Chief, yes, please. We've got um, okay. a little bit over 10 minutes. So, thanks, um, Stephen and Buddy. We, yeah. we had a few different items to review here that's related to um, continuity of operations, but I think that um, I have to, um, I'm not going to be able to go over all of them. So, um, Deanne, I don't know if there's anything that, that uh, you guys stated that, that the big news is, is that um, the World Arena, um, the last day for mass vaccination there will be the 27th. Um, we still have a mass vaccination site at the Chapel Hills. We're working to see if we can put something um, at the Citadel Mall. Um, so we have something on the south side. We're still working with the vaccine consortium and having access points throughout the um, County, we are um, highly engaged in the mobile vaccinations and working through test partners. We're also members of um, seeing um, a mobile vaccination um, van um, at, at most two um, to ensure that, that we're able to continue um, mass vac or not mobile vaccinations, working through our trusted partners and putting them to schools or events. You know, it it it's um, in rural um, communities, so that effort is still going. And um, Deanne, is there anything else, just in the interest of time, that you um, want to mention? One other item I would like to add to the conversation is that uh, since March, we have been in um, incident command since March of 2020 with uh, Unified Command with the Pikes Peak Region Office of Emergency Management. And as we see some of the disease metrics uh, decline, as well as seeing some of the demand for these uh, large scale vaccination efforts, um, uh, moving more to smaller events and mobile events. We're also at the point where we have the opportunity to ramp down some of our emergency coordination center 
efforts and allow some of our team members to, instead of being so singularly focused on COVID, um, really allow our agency to get back to uh, more of a broad uh, spectrum of public health services, which will be very important during the recovery phase as well. So we are looking forward to um, uh, standing down our emergency coordination center. However, that doesn't mean that we lose our bandwidth or our focus on COVID. That will remain. We will remain in close coordination with our Office of Emergency Management as well as we move um, into later stages of the response. And uh, along with that, we are also working on after action reports because certainly when we talk about a response of this duration, there are so many lessons that we can take from this event to inform uh, future activities as well. And as part of that after action process, we're also mindful that this has um, is not just our, our staff and our activities we undertook, but also the policy making boards and partnerships that informed our response. So we'll be working uh, towards ways in which we can solicit input from our Board of Health members as well to inform those after action reports and look forward to bringing that opportunity forward to you. Excellent. I would really encourage board members to go ahead and, and read through uh, these uh, uh, on the agenda items. The, the four that it's a, I, I plan to read myself are the uh, four abstracts that were submitted and presented at the uh, Council for State and Territorial Epidemiologists. They're very sciencey. Uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, in in depth uh, review of these will get will get uh, deep into the weeds. Uh, we're not going to do it today, but it looks like there's been a really significant amount of work that went on there uh, in in uh, in the area of research. So good job, all of. Uh, all these folks. Any other Board of Health member or Susan comments? No, I, I would just say that these I, are I, great. Yeah, <laughs> I, I don't think that they're included in the board packet. So what we'll do is we'll um, send you? those out through email. But yeah. um, through 2020, we've um, received a number of recognitions, accolades, and awards, and honorable mentions, not um, at, at the state yeah. level and um, elsewhere. And um, Dirk and I are going to be, or the CEO of the the chamber and the economic development we're going to be presenting on the national stage I think in July. Um, but, but there's an it, as has been mentioned, I mean we've we've got a phenomenal team. This is super. Um, and and there's a, a lot of recognitions and great work that's going on, just not enough time to um, relay it all. But we'll send that out. And, and can we put it on our website too, these scientific papers? That would mm -hmm. yes. Even though they're pre-published. Yeah. Okay. We'll check with our team. If we can, if we can do that, that would, I think that'd that would fantastic. be fantastic. The solid. abstracts, at least. They're yeah. solid. Okay. Terrific. Anything else, Susan? Uh, I have a lot more, but not enough time. So, um, let's stop there. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, how about though an update on our? Um, uh, south side. Could you do that? That's, I think, particularly important. Can you sure. do that briefly? Please? Sure. Um, so the uh, our new building, um, which we have not had um, for that long, it's uh, Sam Geek had mentioned earlier that there's going to be a, a resurfing of the uh, and repairing the parking lot, which you guys are aware of that it needed in the city of Fountainhead um, agreed to to do that, um, the, the parking lot has not been free to do so because we've been doing points of dispensing and also testing and, and uh, very busy um, in that parking lot. So that will be happening um, very soon. And we're in the process of um, doing some lease agreements with the city of Fountain, um, Fountain um, Police Department and Mount Carmel. Um, you all are aware that we wrote the grant for the Sheriff's Office for the Behavioral Health Unit. Um, for an officer to be paired with a uh, uh, behavioral health professional with numerous different partners, UC Health um, as well. So there is going to be an effort that is launched out of our South building, which is the Beacon unit um, with the Fountain PD. So they will have um, space there. And we um, uh, would love to take you guys on a tour at, at, at some point. And so the, the former substation um, 
space will be turned into a, a workspace also for um, El Paso County staff because we need more staffing and we're looking at like hoteling or um, you, um, many individuals using one space, not just a, um, a dedicated office. So that that will be happening um, at that building. We do want to plan a ribbon cut, cutting ceremony when um, things uh, are able to come together since we have not been able to do that um, during during the pandemic. And the operations team, Melissa, Shannon, Ely, um, Vicki Bennett, I mean, they, they've been doing a number of different in improvements in that building um, as it relates to just being highly um, functional and, and usable. If you remember that there was like an event center, so there was a lot of tool and different things and lights up. And so we're, we're changing um, some of that. And we're also in the works um, of working with uh, Fort Carson and the city of uh, Fountain to hold a strategic um, planning two day meeting with um, um, Fort Carson, and that would be late October. So there's a lot of efforts that are um, in the works and I know that we've done over 20,000 vaccinations in that building. We've received so many, um, you know, so much positive feedback, whether it's in written form, emails or verbal about um, that that clinic is second to none um, with with vaccinations and people um, are really uh, they feel comfortable there, um, a trusted environment and um, that that building has has been um, very, very productive um, for public health and our partners. Thank you. I'm particularly excited about partnering with Fort Carson next to that Southern South building. Um, any anything else for us? There's, there's so much good stuff here. I, it'll it's in your packet. We'll post it on the website and uh, perhaps at a future meeting. It's no, Sundays if you want to no. want to talk about. It. Yeah, I mean, there, there, there's so much, but um, I know that we still have items on the agenda, so okay. I'm stopping. OK, <laughs> thank you. Trying to squeeze now uh, under the category. Uh, this is number 10 under the category of uh, well deserved and long overdue um, during executive session. Uh, we had uh, a discussion uh last meeting and this is the result this is a resolution of the el paso county board of health to um uh, increase the uh, uh the pay of our uh, public health uh, director susan whelan and um, uh the the wording doesn't do you justice we had an opportunity to go through in some detail the accomplishments uh of um the last uh, we're really eight, 18 months now, almost almost two years. Uh, Susan was I'll just say this out loud. Susan was due a performance appraisal review last uh, uh, July uh, during the middle of COVID. We were a little busy, so um, this uh, is an attempt to go ahead and and catch up. So I'm going to go ahead and read this resolution. Our lawyers advise us this is the right way to do it, and then we can uh, then we can vote. Whereas pursuant to Section 251508, the El Paso County Board of Health has the power and duty to an employee of a public health director for El Paso County Public Health to serve at the pleasure of the Board of Health as the administrative and executive head of public health. And whereas Director Susan Whelan currently serves as our public health director, and whereas the Board of Health evaluated Ms. Whelan's performance during her annual review held on May 26, 2021, finding her work and leadership to be exceptional and having no concerns, and whereas feedback about Ms. Whelan's performance from both public health and other El Paso County employees and officials has been remarkably positive, including a noticeable increase in collaboration and whereas the El Paso County Board of Health recognized the outstanding leadership and dedication of Ms. Whelan during the COVID-19 pandemic at resolution number 2020-06, including her successful efforts to reorganize the infrastructure of the public health workforce to enhance efficiencies, engage in cross-sector collaboration, own the role of chief health strategist, and promote the data-driven science-based best practices of public health 3.0. Enhance transparent, accurate, and timely communication, both within public health and to partner agencies, the Board of Health, the El Paso County Board of County Commissioners, the Colorado Springs City Council, the media, and the residents of El Paso County, and 
work closely with the local business community, including the Colorado Springs Chamber and Economic Development Council, the El Paso County, uh, the Pikes Peak World Workforce, the Pikes Peak Small Business Development Center, and others. Whereas a 2020 salary survey by the Colorado Association of Public Health officials determined that Ms. Whelan's current salary is below the average of other comparable positions in Colorado, taking into account population served and annual budgets administered, and whereas the Board of Health further weighed the constraints of the El Paso County budget and salaries of other members of county leadership and recognize the board's duty of fiscal responsibility. And whereas, in consideration of the above, the Board of Health wishes to increase the annual salary of Susan Whelan, Public Health Director, as set forth below. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the El Paso <coughs> County Board of Health, Susan Whelan's compensation as Public Health Director shall be increased by 15% per annum to 186613 retroactive to January 1, 2021, plus one time performance bonus of $10,000, along with all other ordinary employment benefits accorded to full time public health employees effective immediately at any future salary adjustment for the public health director position may be made by resolution of the Board of Health or by direction given to staff at the sole discretion of the Board of Health. <clears throat> Any discussion? I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'd entertain a motion and a second, please. Okay. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Aye. There we go. We have anybody, any public comment? Anybody out there who would like to say something? Or do we have any? I don't think we have anyone in the room. No? Okay, so no public comment. We do typically not meet in July. And so it was my recommendation during a previous meeting with, with Susan and Deanne that if we need to meet, if there is some public health emergency, we can call an emergency meeting of the Board of Health and get together either in person or virtually. But I would suggest or recommend that we not meet in July and instead meet again on August 25th. We don't have to have a resolution, but I would like to hear any any uh, comments from Board of Health members that don't think that's a good idea. Hearing none, we won't meet in July. We'll meet again next August 25th. Uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> We gotta catch a bus, so we gotta, we gotta go. catch up. Yeah. Thank you all. You're Thank awesome. You. Love you all. Thanks Take so care. Thank you. Thank you.